Hey there, welcome to Little Guys, a series of videos about little guys. These are all PCs. These are normal, you know, x86 PCs that run Windows or Linux or whatever you want. They're just like your laptop or your desktop PC, except they're not big. PCs have a tendency to be big guys. They usually have lots of built-in features that the average consumer wants. You know, a laptop has a screen and a keyboard, and a desktop usually has somewhere to put storage devices and, you know, a lot of ports for plugging in your peripherals and often a GPU and things like that, taking up a bunch of excess space that you don't really need. This category of devices, however, often includes machines that are pared down to the absolute bare minimum. Uh, devices that uh, pretty much don't spare a single square inch or millimeter of space that they don't need to. And of course, these are still bigger than like the Intel Nook and like Gigabyte Bricks and uh, stuff like that. But the difference is these are not sold to consumers. All these devices are meant to be sold exclusively to businesses. They are industrial computers uh, and sometimes they're sold under specific names for what they're expected to be used for, like digital sign controllers. There's a whole lot of those. In fact, several of these might be those. And that's probably self-explanatory, but just to be clear, if you go to a mall and you walk along the stores and you see all the like 42 inch televisions in the windows that are running just like a slideshow. Every single one of those has one of these behind it in my experience. Now you'd think that since you could just go to Amazon and for like $10, you could buy a little gadget uh, that takes an SD card. It just plays a slideshow off of it or like an MP4 file or whatever. You'd think that'd be what they would do. But from what I understand, pretty much nobody does that, even though the technology has been around for decades. I think because then you have to have somebody put the files on the SD card, right? Just in practical terms, having worked with people who worked with mall stores and whatnot, generally speaking, they just don't pay people enough to figure out how to do that sort of thing. Uh, they'll run the register and not a whole lot more. So I think what happens is that devices like this get deployed so they can be plugged into the network. And then when the sign images need to be changed or when something isn't working, uh, you could just have somebody log in from the help desk remotely using like log me in or something like that. And then nobody on site has to actually lay hands on anything other than to maybe go pull the power and plug it back in. Like I said, there's a whole galaxy of devices that are for that exact purpose and nothing else. Uh, in fact, that's what this guy is, uh, although we won't be looking at that in this episode. And I have another one actually running my router here at home. I have a PF Sense box uh, that I built around a Shuttle DS81. I don't know if you knew that Shuttle was still in business, but they still are. Nowadays, however, they mostly make stuff like this, little guys. The DS actually stands for digital sign, as I understand it. So it happens to have two Ethernet ports for some reason, so I was able to use it to build a router. But other than that, it's just meant to sit behind a TV in a mall window and just play a slideshow forever. Now, that seems like a very boring category of device, but that's just it. That's what I love about them. They are boring. These things are all just PCs. They have Windows licenses on the bottom. Well, this one doesn't. There it is. They just run Windows or Linux, I guess. Although in my experience, nobody ever does that. Every time I've ever seen one of these things, they've been running Windows. And I think the reason for that is simply that Windows is easier to remotely administer. There are tons of remote access programs you can run on it. It's also easier to get software quickly and dirtily developed for it and easier to find pre-made software, do whatever you want. And a lot of the companies that buy these things and set them up don't have a lot of technical staff. They're really just slamming things together and then selling them to someone. So they want to be able to just buy stuff off the shelf and deploy it, and they don't care about spending a few extra dollars on a Windows license. And you're probably seeing the comparison to like the Intel Nook and Gigabyte Bricks and, and all those other devices that are about yay big that popped up circa like 2012. And that comparison's valid. The difference is A, those are sold to consumers, so they don't have any industrial features, whereas these do, as I'll explain. But another thing is that they're usually not very strange. Uh, they're pretty much just laptop motherboards that have been folded up on themselves. They don't usually have any unusual features. Whereas these things universally have odd features. Sometimes they're inside, sometimes they're outside. Uh, but for instance, uh, this guy has four RJ45 serial ports sticking out of it. Weird. It also takes power through this uh, funky screw terminal. You actually have to wire up your own power supply for this. It also has this DIO port, that's digital IO, and that's uh, sort of like GPIO on a Raspberry Pi, except that it's opto-isolated, meaning that uh, it can't be blown up if you send it way too much voltage. We also have ports here for remote reset and remote power switch, and I don't know exactly what you'd do with those, but 
I imagine you could actually like put 50 feet of wire on those and run them up to like the front of a store. So if the sign controller crashes, somebody can just reach under the counter and hit the button, right? I mean, more likely you just have this aside like a, a relay case and these would be the switches on the outside of it. But at any rate, uh, there's always something like that, some weird feature on every one of these little guys that you just will never find on a normal consumer PC. They're just built in odd ways. You find stuff you'd never find in a laptop or an Intel Nook or anything like that. So I just think they're neat. I've been stumbling across these things for years and just ignoring them because as much as I liked them, I was like, what is there to say about them? And there really isn't anything to say about them. They're PCs, they run Windows or whatever else. But you know what? I feel like talking about them. So I'm just gonna start buying up every single one that I find and I'll make a short video about each one. And if I have nothing to say, then it'll be a five minute video. And if I have something to say, then it might be a very long video. Like the one we're gonna do today. Let's go ahead and get rid of all these guys. So this guy actually has a brand name, which is not universal with these things. Some of them, it's really hard to tell what they actually are. Oh, hang on. I'm being yelled at by a cat. Hello, Soba. Hi. You're inconveniencing me. Can you go? I don't think she's gonna be going. So this is a Logic Supply AU912. And uh, I wanna get some info about this, but I'm really sick of having to do tons of research before shooting every one of my videos. So in this series, I'm just gonna do a thing I call, let's ask the internet, where we ask the internet for the answer and hope we get the right one. So when you look this up, instead of getting like a website for the company or anything, you just get a whole bunch of articles from like Linux devices, military embedded systems, uh, hot hardware, talking about this thing as part of a, like a genre of device. Now, something I find really interesting is that this was sold as a bare bone, which seems kind of strange since I think usually this sort of machine, all these little guys, are sold as, you know, turnkey solutions. But this one is a little different, I think. It was sold as a ruggedized, fanless industrial computer, but you have to provide your own CPU, as the bare bone suggests. And what's interesting is it says it supports the i5 or i7, but of course, you know, Intel chipsets support any CPU that they were designed for. So you can also put a Celeron or a Core i3 in it. It's weird for them to specify what CPU it would be when you're gonna provide the CPU and when this list isn't even complete. Now this was apparently sold as an extended temperature product uh, because it could tolerate a really wide temperature range, but this article got the numbers wrong. It says minus four to 13 degrees Fahrenheit. I, um, I think they probably meant 130 degrees because they also made an extreme environment version that supports minus 40 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. It also says it's designed to resist shocks of up to 20 Gs, which will not surprise you once you see how the thing is built. It is a shit brick house. Anyway, this uses a QM57 chipset and the rest of it we'll learn about as we take a look at it. So let's start on the back. So much of this is very normal. We've got uh, four USB ports back here. I guarantee you those are only USB 2.0. Uh, then we have you know just basic audio. We've got dual network interfaces. And you might assume those are gigabit, but I wouldn't because I've seen devices that are newer than this one uh, that actually only had 10100. It went on for much longer than you'd think. Then of course we have VGA, which is pretty much the lowest common denominator of computer video and will be forever for some obvious reasons and others which I think can be blamed on the DVI HDMI display port mess never getting fully resolved. What I do like though is that the DVI port is so optional that the cutout here is actually for a DB25. And I think that's because you could put a parallel port here. It has a header inside for it. Uh, but here they've gone with the DVI. So they've actually built a bracket uh, that screws into the DB25 pattern and then has the, the DVI jack screws inside of it. I just think that's really funny to look at. But then we have the really strange things. We've got COM1 through COM4. So this is a quad serial port. And serial is another thing that you just see all over the place in industrial computers. Uh, gets used for all kinds of stuff from, you know, talking to CNC milling machines to, uh, uh, in one case, I actually worked with a customer once who managed a bunch of gas stations and they had stuff like this uh, stuck up behind their billboards. Uh, the ones that like loom over the highway and have the big LED signs on them with the gas prices. And this thing just sat there all day long in the blistering heat, uh, just updating the sign periodically to say that gas was, you know, 4.75 a gallon. 
Now the basic serial port, the DE9, is a pretty big connector, and sometimes they take the approach of using RJ45s, like we saw on the other machine, uh, to fit more COM ports onto a device, but in this case they've gone with what appears to be a, like a DB36. And finding a cable for this is gonna be pretty tough, I do, in fact, have one, uh, but as you'll see later, it's not actually the right one. And then finally, we've got the power connector here, which is, of course, uh, the strangest thing about it. Good luck finding anything to plug in there. And I say that, but really, this is a standard connector. You could get this from, you know, Mauser or DigiKey. You could probably get it on Amazon. And all you have to do is wire up a power supply to it. Now, when I got it, it came with a power supply. So there it is right there. Somebody just uh, cut the ends off of a Dell power supply and stripped the wires and, and stuck them into this plug and screwed them down and that's it. It puts out 19 and a half volts and this thing will take anywhere from 10 to 28 volts. But what's interesting about that is it doesn't say what current or, or wattage rating it needs because of course it varies depending on what you put in there. If you put a Celeron in here versus an i7, you're gonna have wildly different current requirements. Uh, and of course, we have card slots. That's the other very unusual thing about this. Most industrial PCs don't have any sort of full-size expansion ports. Usually they'll have more than you'd expect, but they'll be like mini PCI or, or M2 or something like that. This one, uh, as you'll see, actually has some full-size card slots and you could put some pretty power hungry stuff in there. So it's really up to you to figure out which power supply you need. And if you pull too much current, the machine's just gonna shut off when the uh, overcurrent protection trips and you're just gonna have to suss out that you need a, a bigger power supply. Such is life, right? Anyway, we also have SW pins on here, which I'm gonna assume uh, can be attached to a remote switch. You can turn the thing on and off. Uh, and then finally, we've got this antenna port here. Uh, this doesn't have Wi-Fi, but you could add it. And obviously the case being all metal, uh, it won't have much luck unless the antenna's outside. There is exactly one other interesting thing about the back side of this, and that's this rubber plug right here. Think about that. I'll, uh, I'll show you what that's for later. Okay, so now we get to the front. Now the front has a couple fun things going on. This being an industrial machine, it has a PS2 port and presumably you could use one of those splitters to get both keyboard and mouse in there. Why is PS2 still a thing in industrial applications? I have no idea, not even gonna speculate. Uh, then we have four more USB 2 ports on the front and then we've got activity and link lights for the two network interfaces so you don't have to go around the back of the thing to see if they're on. This again makes it a lot easier to do remote diagnostics when you have somebody on site who's not savvy. You just ask them to go look at the thing and tell you uh, what the six lights on the front look like. Now the most interesting thing about this however is this panel right here. It's not unusual for industrial computers to boot off of solid state storage. Uh, sometimes they just use internal USB ports, sometimes there's a, uh, like a CF card or an SD card slot, uh, but this one has CFast. Now I admit, um, I always have trouble keeping CFast and CF Express straight in my head, uh, although there's actually no way to confuse the two. That's CFast, that's CF Express. They don't look anything alike, and they really shouldn't have used the CF prefix uh, for CF Express, but it doesn't really matter because virtually nothing seems to use these. Just in case you don't know, because these are getting pretty long in the tooth these days, this is Compact Flash. It is a very old uh, solid state memory format, and it is essentially just an ATA hard drive in a very small form factor. These came out in like the mid 90s, and they were used as storage for like digital cameras and that sort of thing. And then as time went on, they became popular for use in like routers and, you know, industrial PCs and that sort of thing as boot media. Because often you didn't need more than, you know, 256 megs of space. Uh, and since these have no moving parts and you usually only need to read them once on boot up and then you never touch them again, they would last for just decades and decades and never fail. So they were ideal for that sort of thing. But of course they're very old now and it makes sense that eventually someone would supersede the format, right? Except, I mean, everything that was using stuff like this didn't really need better performance and that's the only real reason to replace it. So it, it didn't really need to be replaced not that it hurts, just nobody really cared, and a lot of stuff that was using CF continues to use CF or has switched over to SD. So consequently, I had never seen a CFast card in the flesh, not once, until the other day when uh, someone handed me a whole stack of them and said, hey, can you get rid of these? Nobody wants them. These are 32 gig CFast cards, and as you can see, the connector on the end is quite different, and it very closely resembles Serial ATA because it is, in fact, literally Serial ATA. 
With Compact Flash being uh, ATA in a portable format, it makes sense that its replacement would just be serial ATA in a portable format. It makes sense except for the fact that, you know, seemingly nobody wants it. The only time I've ever seen this in anything are in my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K cameras that I use at the studio. And these, for instance, would uh, get filled up by my camera in like four or five minutes, if not less. So they're not terribly useful to me either. But apparently, uh, whoever made this machine decided that they would make a good boot medium. It's just funny though, because they put it behind this uh, screwed on cover, like a battery powered toy for a child. <laughs> And I mean, it makes sense. This is gonna go in, you know, who knows what environment. You don't want people fiddling with it, but it's still extremely funny. Now, when I first took a look at this, I, I thought I could see notches on the side, uh, much like you do with CF, and it looked like it needed to go in upside down because that's where the, the lower notch on here is. But no, it just goes in label side up. Just like CF, it's kind of fiddly and hard to get in the first time, but then listen to this. It's actually got the uh, little spring-loaded catch and eject mechanism, just like uh, SD usually does. So I gotta admit, that actually is an improvement. Uh, Compact Flash, for some reason, didn't support that sort of thing, or at least nobody ever built it. Uh, so you often had to have a little flip-out lever, uh, just like uh, Cardbus or PCMCIA. And uh, I've actually had cases where those got broken off, and you had to use like a screwdriver to eject the card. Or, a lot of the time, you just rip it out bodily. It's got a little... Uh, ridge on the bottom here. You just had to catch that with your fingernail and, and pull it out. Really irritating. So this is an improvement. Now, I will say this down here is supposed to be a SIM card slot, uh, but as I'll show you later, I'm not convinced there's actually any hardware behind that. Nothing shows up in an operating system, and I don't have a SIM card to stick in there to test. But anyway, let's take this thing apart and get some answers to <sighs> juicier questions. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this thing is a joy to work on. There's only one size of screw in the entire device. Although, once you get the uh, top screws out, the cover um, doesn't doesn't really go anywhere. It turns out that you just have to reef on it and it comes off. And part of that's just because it is incredibly heavy. At its thickest, uh, excluding the machined fins here, uh, this thing is like 3 eighths of an inch thick. It is a massive hunk of aluminum. And I don't remember my metric at all, so let's ask the internet how thick that is. That is 9.5 millimeters. So obviously this is as thick as it is because it's a heat sink, right? It's gotta absorb all that heat before it can re-radiate it because this machine is of course fanless. Uh, and so that's why we've got this massive thermal pad up here. But let's talk about that for a moment. You may have noticed this, but uh, it's, um, it's wet. <laughs> There's some sort of liquid on here, some kind of oil on the surface. It's actually puddled up around each of these holes. It was worse the first time I took it off. And it's just uh, smeared all over the top. You can actually see it on the side rails here as well. And you can see it on the thermal pads. So it appears that the thermal pads are, um, they're leaking. So what's this about? Let's ask the internet. When I Google this, the first result is, I'm scared. Why is it greasy slash moist when removing thermal pads? I go to the thermal pad store. I ask if it's greasy slash moist. She laughs at me. It's a good thermal pad, sir. I put one on my CPU. It's moist. Okay, here we go. This is an article on LinkedIn uh, that says that the silicone thermal pad will generate greasy substances on the surface of the heat sink. This is called oil bleeding phenomenon. <laughs> So here's the thing, I've never been clear on how these thermal pads worked. So I always sort of assumed that they were uh, kind of like a foamed rubber, uh, like a, an, an open cell neoprene kind of thing that had just been saturated with a thermally conductive oil, like mineral oil or something like that. This says that most of the volatiles are dimethyl cyclosilazane, uh, which has been identified as a suspected carcinogen. So I probably should wash my hands, but I imagine I'm probably fine if I don't, you know, lick it. The silicone thermal pad is a composite material prepared by mixing two parts, a silicone elastomer and a thermally conductive filler that provides high thermal conductivity. So I don't think the foam part is accurate. This suggests that the um, free unreacted vinyl silicone oil is supposed to cross-link with the silicone. So it's it's not really like impregnated with it. It sounds like it's sort of a, um, a silicone rubber that's maintained in a partially over-plasticized state, which is, does that make sense? I don't know, but it's really weird. But then it goes on to say that uh, methyl silicone oil with inactive groups 
or even white oil can be used as a plasticizer, and this problem is often caused by adulteration by black heart suppliers. Um, I don't think I'll be looking into what that is. I don't think I want to know. So yeah, it appears that oil bleeding is quite a common phenomenon. It could be caused by the pads just getting too hot, which makes sense if uh, this thing was fanless and we you, you know, used really hard and, and put away wet as it were. Uh, well, literally in this case. Um, but it does sound like it's not too terribly dangerous. I'll just try to resist the urge uh, to drink the forbidden thermal juice. At any rate, however, we're in, as it were, and there's not a whole lot to look at so far because uh, we need to get this heat sink out of the way. Uh, but there are a couple things uh, worth mentioning. For one thing, this board is enormous. A lot of these machines are just not very big. Like this one is, you know, the volume of two or three Raspberry Pis, whereas this one is like a good 10 Raspberry Pis. That's a metric we'll be using. And I'm not exactly sure why. Like, there's not a lot more going on here than there is on most of the uh, industrial PCs I've looked at. It, it seems to have pretty much all the common parts, but for some reason it's just bigger than most. So maybe there's fewer parts on the backside of the board or something like that. Uh, but at any rate, nothing in here is all that exotic. I do like the use of these uh, upright sodium slots. You see these on industrial PCs a lot. Uh, they're not actually that great. They're kind of not as nice to work with as the ordinary uh, laptop style ones that, that lay down. Uh, it's kind of weird. You'd think that they would be better, but it's actually kind of hard to navigate the stick in there and to get it to seat. But I think they use these because they take up less surface area on the board itself, right? Like less um, less uh, footprint than the lay down ones. Because if they use the normal laptop ones, where would they have put them? There's, there's nowhere in here for them. So anyway, this takes normal DDR3 sodiums. I actually could upgrade the RAM in here if I wanted to. There's our CFast card. And you know what? Let's see, if we take this out, will there be any hint as to whether there's a SIM card reader under that? Eh, no, unfortunately, I would have to take the whole motherboard out. Maybe we'll do that. So over here, we have mini PCIe. Uh, you would use this for like a Wi-Fi card. That's why you've got the antenna slot over here. Uh, and the strangest thing you can see from this perspective is actually the audio amplifier chip, uh, this guy down here, which is a through hole component. Not that that doesn't work just fine, but it is really, really odd on a modern motherboard. I mean, this thing is probably from about 2011 per the uh, uh, news article I read, but all the same, could they really have not found a surface mount version of that? Oh, right, one other thing. There's this temperature sensor. I have seen this before, but it's, it's always funny when I do. It's just sort of this bit of mylar hanging out in midair that's been siliconed to the board so it doesn't break off its traces. <laughs> it looks silly, but I guess it works. Anyway, so that's all we can see from here. Next step, we're gonna wanna take off the heat sink. And this is a process that's sort of fraught with peril. Uh, this one has three screws here and the three screws there. I'm gonna take them off in a cross pattern because I don't know what's underneath. And for all I know, there could be something that doesn't have a heat spreader. And if I don't take them off in a way that spreads the load around, I could crack a core. So I'm gonna take this off like I'm doing a, a wheel on a car. And then for the last two, I just take them out a little bit at a time. A turn there, a turn there, a turn there, and then we run them the rest of the way out. All right, and this guy just pops off. And as it turns out, my fears were founded because this processor is in fact one with exposed cores. So it turns out that the chips that they used in here is a Intel QM57, which is a mobile version of the Q57 chipset. And so it takes a mobile CPU. This is a laptop style Core i3. Interesting fact about that, by the way, uh, this processor is copyright 08, according to the label on it. So I thought this machine was older than it is. I, I forgot when the first Core i series chips came out, <sighs> forgive me. If we ask the internet how old that chip is, it says it's from Q1 2010. I don't know why it's copyright 08. Um, I guess I can't rely on those to tell me the age of a chip anymore, which uh, has probably made a fool of me several times in the past. But anyway, here's what I think is strange about this. These were sold as bare bone machines. So you were expected to get your own CPU. And I don't know if it's any harder to order a mobile chip. I assume it isn't. 
uh, although you can't buy them in stores, right? I, I guess you got to get it from some sort of middleman, but what else is new? But the thing is, laptops all use custom heat sinks made by the laptop manufacturer. But this board vendor selling the board by itself would not have provided anything like that, I wouldn't think. So it's up to the manufacturer of the chassis to make their own cooling solution, which is indeed what they did. This guy here was obviously made by whoever made the case because it's, you know, custom fit to it. And it's not a heat sink. It is a heat conductor. This thing's sole purpose is to get the heat from the chip up to the top of the case so the radiator on top can dissipate it. So this is just a big aluminum shaft. But what's weird is there's no there's no shim, there's no springs, there's there's nothing to keep this from cracking the core. So in fact, had I not been judicious with how I released the screws, if I had taken them all off on the left side first, uh, that would have produced a seesaw effect that could indeed have damaged this. I mean, this happened all the time back in the Athlon XP and, and Pentium 3 days. Uh, people would chip cores even with a shim, even with spacers. It happened constantly. So this is kind of a weird decision. And even stranger, it seems like the motherboard manufacturer provided a mounting pattern on both of these, I assume that's the uh, QM57 there, uh, to put individual sinks on them. But this company decided to go with a single monolithic one. And I think the reason for that is that they wanted to cover these coils. I think these are coils used by the voltage regulators. And they did sort of a shitty job of it because, well, these pads just fell off entirely, but they were originally just sort of hanging off the corner of the sink here, not even fully on it. So that's all pretty janky, but not nearly as janky as what's going on over here. Uh, but to show you that, I'm gonna have to take off the side panel and that's quite involved. So let's uh, proceed with the tour here and we'll come back to it. To proceed, we have to take the bottom panel off. Now, this guy is not nearly as thick as the top panel, uh, but when I first looked at it, I wondered if uh, this black stuff here was actually like some sort of thermally conductive material because this is the card cage, and if you put a card down here that emits a lot of heat, uh, then I was thinking, well, if it's black body radiation, maybe the uh, black makes it better at absorbing that into the panel so it can then spread out to the, the wings here to get dissipated. But then later I was thinking about it and I went, yeah, or it's just plastic because this this is metal and they didn't want the, the card down here to short out against it. So here's the card cage and we've got one PCI Express 16 and one X1. And what I like about these is uh, a lot of the time with uh, devices that have risers, they'll have some sort of custom connector at the motherboard uh, that both of the PCI lanes are run through. But in this case, they're just straight across traces from one plug to the other. They used an X1 for the X1 and an X16 for the X16. Sure makes it a lot simpler. The other thing that's in here is the hard drive cage, and I'll go ahead and take that out so you can see. This actually holds two drives, uh, which makes the component density on this machine really high. Like I said, a lot of these industrial machines have pretty decent expandability, but this thing has both the CFast card on the front which we can in fact boot from and use as the sole medium in this device. And then it also has capacity for two expansion cards and two SATA hard drives. That's terrific. Like that's, that's on par with like most desktop PCs. Although the way the SSDs attach is very interesting because it's very different. This one attaches here and the connector sticks off the end. This one attaches here using the side screws and it's scooted way back. It also only accepts drives of a specific thickness, at least not without a lot of fiddling. Like if we try to put this uh, Seagate Nitro in here, it uh, doesn't line up with the holes. And if we flip it over, it still doesn't line up with the holes. And of course I could hold it up, you know, and, and put the screws in, but they're at that distance because if we take like an Intel SSD, uh, the early ones that had the shim on here that makes them as thick as a conventional laptop hard drive of the era, then that sits at exactly the right height. It's weird because they could have just put the screws at the bottom and that would have fit every type of drive. So I don't know why they did this. But what's stranger is the drives attached to the computer in completely different ways. So we have a standard SATA data connector and then we have a four pin Molex, uh, which has the exact same pinout as a standard floppy drive. So you adapt this out to a SATA power connector. It's not supposed to be standard, but in practice there are lots of cables like this out there. This sort of configuration is very normal for devices like this, but this, is a different story. If you've logged significant time working on laptops, you probably know that an awful lot of them have a little shim that you plug into a hard drive that makes it easier to plug it into the machine, both in the IDE era and in the SATA era. 
This is designed for one of those. And what's strange is that it's specifically a Dell style shim. Dell made two of these. Uh, this is the sort that I got in my Alienware M17X that featured in Quick Start Guide N episode one, uh, the one with the HDMI input. And I think this is more common than the other one, this guy here. It's basically the same concept, except it's got exposed pins instead of uh, flat contacts. But both of these are designed to make it possible to drop a hard drive down into place rather than sliding it into place. And that's exactly how this works. So if we take this drive here and just fit this on there and then put it back in here, there we go. It's plugged in just like that. It's actually so easy that I, I really thought I was gonna have to fiddle with it every time, just like sort of jiggle it to get it into place. No, it drops right in. It's wonderful. And that just really contrasts the other approach, which uses these cables. And it turns out that's really fiddly. I spent a good hour uh, trying to find a solution because I didn't have exactly the right cables. Finding a really short SATA data cable is easy enough, but for the power, this is the best I could come up with because I didn't have one that actually went from this to that because that, that isn't actually standard or common. Uh, so I had to use a splitter uh, that's common together at this end and just tape over that. I've plugged this in and it does work, but it's super awkward, especially because there's no way to get it through the little cable management hole down here without taking the drive chassis out. And then even once you do, there's very uh, limited constraints to get it into the drive. I was able to do it, but the point is you're supposed to have a little custom made cable for this. And it, it seems kind of unnecessary because if they just backed the drive up by a couple more millimeters, you'd be able to fit it with normal cables. But while we've got this open, let's go ahead and pull off uh, this side sink. And in fact, maybe we'll just take the whole motherboard out. I have not yet done that. Let's begin with the riser card. This thing is actually a dream to work on. I mean, given that it was sold as a bare bones, it makes sense, right? If you're working on like a laptop or, or an all-in-one, something like that, you're not really supposed to be in there. So the only thing that matters are manufacturing considerations and those can be mitigated. But if you're selling this to an end user who's expected to actually build it up themselves uh, and maybe even maintain it over time, then it makes sense to design it so it can be easily disassembled. And they've done that. This is one of the easier <laughs> risers that I've ever removed. And like I said, every single screw in this is exactly the same. Uh, the ones for the heat sinks internally, externally, the motherboard screws, the riser screws, everything is exactly identical. Whoops, I guess I could have put, took, taken this screw out instead of the other one. <laughs> well, we'll fix that later. The heat sinks on the sides are really easy to take off. We just spin out these screws here. Oh, but you know what? I should uh, take the end panels off first now that I think about it. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll just be dangling. Oh, I guess I should say the uh, the one screw that's different uh, are the ones that go in the end because they're, uh, they're supposed to sit flush, but uh, they're not easy to mix up with the others. Oh, another industrial consideration that you usually find, this screw here is designated as a ground screw. So it's got the uh, little lock washer on there so you can hang a, uh, an eye lug off of it. Again, this comes apart so easily. And that's another thing that I really like about uh, looking at these little industrial PCs is that they're all designed to be worked on or at least they're not designed to be obfuscated. All right, now we just take off the sinks Look at all these screws. All right, we finally have a clear view of the board here. <laughs> so this is a, a parallel port expansion. Um, this is for more digital IO, I believe. Uh, this is the uh, DVI port, of course. So that's a uh, silicone in place as it should be. But the thing I wanted to show you was this here. This is odd. It's clearly a heat sink. It's got a thermal pad, but Look how loosely it's mounted. And in such a strange way, this uh, piece of sheet metal just sort of running across the top of it. Well, let me take that out. So as it turns out, this is syncing two more of these voltage regulator coils, and that's all it does. But the way that they built this heat sink is fascinating. It's literally just a solid billet with a slot cut in it. It's it's a raw piece of aluminum bar stock. They haven't even uh, machined the sides. Uh, you can see the... Um, the drag marks from the extrusion process on there. So this is just about the simplest heat sink I've ever seen in my life. 
and it's not really surprising because again, it's not a heat sink. Just like the big one, its job is just to get heat from the top of these coils up to the top of the chassis. So yeah, of course it's just a solid piece of metal. And I guess the reason it's so loose is because when you put the top on and crank it down, it uh, compresses this thermal pad and that locks this thing in place and applies the, the necessary pressure to the, to the parts. But it, it just feels and looks so cheap. Anyway, we're this far in. Let's go ahead and finish taking the board out. And presumably that's not gonna come out till we take these standoffs out. I appear to have lost my special nut driver, so we're just gonna have to uh, muscle these out. Well, that wasn't too bad. Let's see if this guy will come out now. Or do we need to remove those ones too? Oh no, it's just held on by all the ports on the back. It is important to keep the motherboard standoffs and the jack screws separate because they have different threads and lengths. All right, let's see if that does it. Yes, it does. So the big questions are, is there anything on the back and does it have a SIM card reader? And the answers to both are yes. Well, they've populated these parts, so I have to assume that whatever is supposed to do the SIM reading, you know, would be in there somewhere. Either that or, or now that I think about it, I wonder if somehow that talks to the mini PCIe slot and you're just supposed to put your, um, your LTE radio in there and it communicates over there somehow. I wouldn't know, that's way out of my wheelhouse. It is interesting that there are more thermal pads back here. Those are directly under these VRMs, so presumably they were trying to get heat off the back of the board too. Those things must get toasty. And this is definitely using both sides of the board because we've got some sophisticated parts here. I wonder what these are. WG8257-4L. That is your quad and dual port gigabit ethernet controller. And then there's a second one right there. So I guess it's one 8257 per ethernet port. Ah, you know what, what are these down here? ST1284. Oh, weird, that's uh, apparently some sort of electromagnetic interference filter in a little surface mount chip. I've never seen anything like that before. F75111R6. Ooh, that doesn't pull up anything. Did I get that wrong? 75111RG. Oh, and that is a 20-line GPIO chip, uh, so that would be feeding that um, unused DIO header we see on the top. So yeah, there you go. Um, the most interesting thing about this board is that it has absolutely no identifying marks that I can find. Like, there are various numbers on here, but I can't seem to correspond them to any sort of manufacturer part number. Uh, and anything I Google just comes up with like um, like websites from parts scavengers that are reselling bits and pieces from uh, uh, you know destroyed systems and whatnot. So I have no idea who makes this. I guess it could be custom for this uh, logic company. That's so rare in my experience, but it does happen. Anyway, let's uh, button this thing back up and we'll turn it on. Did I put those screws in the wrong holes? Something's not right. There should be screw threads back here, but there aren't. Oh, duh. <laughs> you have to put the heat sink on and that provides the screw threads. Boy, I was confused. Now, before we button this thing up, I'm gonna go ahead and install this Quadro card. Uh, the onboard graphics are, you know, Intel HD, whatever, and uh, this is bus powered, so it'll work in this thing, even though there's no, you know, six pin PCIe power or anything like that. But there are two considerations. For one thing, um, how do we get these these brackets out of here? Because the heat sink's kind of in the way. Well, as it turns out, that's what the uh, rubber plug I mentioned earlier is for. Chekhov's plug can be punched out it is really tedious, there we go. And that allows you to drop a screwdriver down to get to the back plane, but only to the bottom card in the back plane. This is actually the one thing about this chassis I don't like. There is, as far as I can tell, no way to get 
to that screw there properly other than to come in like this at an angle. And you can, it's, it's really not too bad, but it sucks, especially because, you know, uh, you're gonna grind through the anodizing on the case doing that over and over like I don't see how else they could have solved it because they would have had to put a hole right right here and it would have gone through this mount hole and Yeah, no, I get it, but it still sucks But the other problem is this uh, There's a fan and we're adding a fan to our fanless PC. How do you think that's gonna go? There's no ventilation down here. This thing is, you know, uh, not waterproof or anything, but it is sufficiently ruggedized uh, that it's pretty much sealed other than this little vent over here. And frankly, I just don't think that's, that's enough ventilation. I did try this card in here once before and believe me, it came out toasty. So this is probably not a good idea long-term, although you could replace this one here with um, a fan card, you would have to figure out a way to get power to it. I guess you could adapt the four pin Molex from the SATA power if you don't need a second hard drive and uh, just plug that into it. So yeah, you know, there's a solution. But getting this screw back in sucks because it immediately tries to cross thread no matter what you do. Yeah, that's, that's how we drive screws in this house. So let's install the hard drive. Again, I love how that just drops into place. Now I've taken out and reinstalled this heat sink several times with no trouble, but man, I still don't trust it. I really do think that uh, if I were to just like crank down one set of screws before the other, I would probably destroy that CPU. And uh, this is a kind of a funny thing, but if I wanted to get second or third gen or sixth gen Core i chips, that's no trouble. They're thick on the ground around here on the used market. But if I want first gen mobile Core i chips, I've never seen one. Like, I know they must exist, but I, I've never actually seen one. All right, same deal. Let's very carefully work things down here. All right, we'll do the center ones first, then the corners. All right, and if I'm very lucky, this still works. All right, now we're gonna need a display. So you're probably gonna be seeing this guy throughout the rest of this series a lot. This is the Supersonic uh, SC1311. It is a 13 inch TV and absolutely the cheapest, lightest weight one I've ever seen in my life. It is astonishingly inexpensive. I love this thing. It is so minimal. I mean, like you've got the exposed brass inserts for the Visa mount. That's perfectly fine, but you know, they haven't bothered to paint them or anything like that. Uh, they've got the screws that are just sitting in these deep depressions here. So it looks like it was blow molded. And of course it takes DC instead of AC, which makes it even cheaper. Uh, but you know, that's also an advantage. I can find power supplies for this anywhere. And otherwise it's very useful. It has HDMI, VGA, a component, composite, and even an ATSC uh, TV tuner. Uh, you can also feed uh, PC audio in at uh, 3.5, so you don't have to use an RCA adapter. Uh, and it has a headphone output. You know, I have no idea what this USB port does. That might just be power, or this thing might have, like, you know, an MP4 player in it or something. I don't know. Uh, but what's important about it is that it doesn't weigh anything, and it is perfectly cromulent to use on my desk here. Uh, it's a 1366 by 768 display, which, you know, isn't all that hot. But you know what? If you put 1080p into this, which it will accept, it scales it down and it looks just fine. Also, it has the lowest switching delay I've ever seen in VGA mode. When you give this thing a VGA signal, it picks it up like that. Because, you know, the fact that this thing is incredibly cheap means the amount of post-processing it has is probably zero. We'll just get the worst keyboard I own and the best mouse I own because we're gamers and we'll accept nothing less. Now, obviously when I call these things little guys, it is with tremendous affection. They're just little guys that are doing their best. Nothing more typifies this than what happens when you turn this one on. It makes little bleeps and bloops. In addition, it does this uh, whenever you unplug or plug in a USB device. It's wonderful. I think it actually stops doing that once an operating system loads, which is kind of a shame because it's just so adorable. And it makes a lot of sense for an industrial computer. It lets you do more basic diagnostics without needing a screen. 
the BIOS is largely normal, but there are a few interesting things in here. For instance, uh, if we go over to the second Super I.O. configuration, that's right, this thing has two Super I.O. chips. Um, now, if you don't know this, Super I.O. refers to a type of chip that's on pretty much every motherboard that combines all the legacy ports, serial, parallel, and PS2, and a lot of other stuff. I think it might also do like SM bus and I2C, but don't quote me on that. These all used to be separate chips back in like the 8088 era, uh, but now they're all combined into one. And normally you would have two serial ports and one parallel port, but since this machine wants four serial ports, they got this extra chip, the FinTech F81216 to do that. But I think it's really weird that it actually says this in the BIOS. What's the purpose of this information? Could this board have been populated with a different Super IO chip? Maybe, I don't know. Also, if we go to SATA configuration, it's kind of interesting because there are five ports listed here, but only physically three ports on the device. There's the CFAST, uh, which shows up in port four, and then the uh, SATA SSD I installed is in port zero. And if I plugged something into the other port, it would be in port one. But then two, three, and five, I have no idea where those are, if they exist at all. I didn't see a, a header on the board for them or anything like that. Also in the Southbridge configuration, there's an option to change the power supply from ATX to AT, and I have no idea what that would do. Anyway, everything else here is pretty much normal. I have no idea why there's an Ubuntu here, by the way. I guess somebody must have booted it off a flash drive at some point, and it just sort of got stuck in, in the EFI. I don't know much about EFI, so I'm not sure how to get rid of that. But anyway, so a question that I had had when I was setting this up is whether these CFAST cards are actually decently performant. See, in theory, the reason to go from ATA to serial ATA would be for higher speed and, I guess, simplified circuitry. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these are actually faster. You know, if this is an industrial card, which I'm pretty sure it is, then it could be absolutely dog slow. It could have <laughs> just absolutely terrible uh, low-end flash in it with no, you know, no DRAM, um, Basically, it could be useful for booting and absolutely nothing else. So I got curious and I ran Crystal Disk Mark. The sequential read and write speeds end up being on par with like some more decent, uh, serious desktop SSDs. Uh, the random read and write are absolutely god awful. It can't even get up to two megabytes per second. And I know that those are usually much, much worse than sequential, but uh, that does seem pretty dang bad. All the same though, I think it's probably a lot better than you'd expect from like a typical compact flash card. So yeah, these these seem all right, I guess. And just for kicks, um, I ran Firmark on here uh, just to see if that Quadro was doing its thing. And well, it is, but 46 frames per second, not too hot, but uh, at least the card is working. Unfortunately, it probably is pretty hot. So I'm not gonna run this for very long. And just in case you're curious, it doesn't appear to be CPU bound. Uh, the graphics card itself is probably just a lot older than I think it is. Although it is possible this is like constrained by being like PCIe 1 or something like that. I don't know what was dominant in uh, 2011. Now I warned you earlier not to assume the network interfaces were gigabit, but they actually are, fortunately. I'm pretty sure this CPU is dual core with hyper threading, so we've got uh, four uh, virtual cores there. Uh, you know, HD audio like usual. No indication of a USB 3.0 controller here, which is not the least bit shocking. There, of course, is our SATA drive and the uh, drive I plugged in with that weird little Dell adapter. I don't know if it's really Dell or if that's just a part that Dell bought, but I've certainly never seen it on anybody else's machines. And then finally, we've got those four uh, serial ports that I mentioned earlier. And like I said, I don't have the right cable for that, uh, but it's kind of sad how close it comes. Let's open two copies of Putty here, and we'll set these up to connect to COM1 and COM2. 1366 by 768 is just enough real estate for two terminal windows. That should be good enough for anyone, right? So it doesn't surprise me at all that multiple companies would come up with the idea of using the uh, DB36 connector for four serial ports. So it doesn't surprise me either that uh, they don't all have compatible pinouts. So if we find ports one and two here and we connect those with a null modem adapter like EA, then when we type in one of these windows, we should see text appear in the other, but we don't. And what's worse than that is if I unplug from two here and I plug in to three, oops, I meant four. When we type here, we don't see anything, but when we type here, we do. And 
that means that these aren't just mislabeled. You know, it's not just that, uh, you know, port one is port four and port two is port three. Uh, it's that this cable is not wired at all correctly. It just coincidentally happens to have a single TX line that landed on another port's RX line. So this is useless, but I'm holding out hope that if I go out to, you know, eBay or whatever, and I, I just look for like two or three other cables like this, uh, chances are good that one of them will just happen to be the right one. And with that, I think I'm pretty much out of stuff to show you. Uh, cause after all, these are just PCs. That's the whole thing that makes me like them and the thing that makes them dull as dishwater. All they do is turn on and run Windows. It's like a crappy laptop in an incredibly heavy case. And I mean, it is a pretty crappy one. A first generation Core i processor is not terribly useful to me. Uh, for other people, it might still be, but I can't really do anything with this. I mean, there might be exceptions. I, I may find a use for it. The fact that it's got these slots is pretty cool. Like I could probably find something I could do with that, like put a couple of uh, capture cards in there or something like that. Uh, and after all, I could maybe use it as a router if I need to, uh, you know, the, the sky's the limit, right? It's just a device. Maybe you'll find a use for a device, maybe not. But I chose this for my first episode of this show because uh, of all the little guys I've come across, this one is really the most flexible, the most versatile. Uh, I, I find it really intriguing that they designed it to be so expandable. You know, it, it was sold as a bare bones, but like I said earlier, normally these things aren't even really sold as, as modular per se. They're expected to be, you know, purchased in bulk, built up for some very specific application with the most minimal components possible, and and that's it, right? This thing, on the other hand, is built a little bit more like a, like a desktop PC, you know, like, like something you might actually add parts to later. And as a result, it ends up being the only one of these I've seen in, in quite some time where I could imagine uh, actually using it for something. So yeah, I'm impressed. Good job, little guy. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. It was a kind of a weird concept. I normally don't do videos that are just off the cuff like this, but I've been wanting to do more of them. Uh, just about things that I think are neat, where I don't have any particular narrative. It gets so frustrating when every one of my videos has to be like researched and uh, written about for weeks before I can go produce it and then edited to within an inch of its life. So yeah, I'm gonna try and do more stuff like this going forward because it's fun to just uh, show you something and go, isn't that cool? And I don't do enough of it. So hopefully you had a good time. Um, I certainly did. And if you enjoyed this, uh, let me know uh, that you want to see more of them and uh, maybe subscribe to my channel. So I, I know you're into this sort of thing. And if you really want to help me out, then consider supporting me on Patreon like um, these people are doing, uh, because this is the sort of thing where when you see it, you just have to grab it. Like there's no reliable source for um, weird little guys like this. I just, I go into a store uh, or somebody contacts me and says, you know, I have this, do you want it? And I just have to say, yes, absolutely. Here's $40 in shipping, send it over. <laughs> so if you want to make sure that I can get more stuff like this for the future, you know, and uh, put gas in my car and groceries on my table and everything like that, then consider becoming a patron. I'd really appreciate it. I'm incredibly grateful to everybody who already is. Um, they make this possible. They make my whole channel possible. So thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching.